uh, we've now reached the highlight of the session, and I will do it from here. Uh, it's uh, very important to recognize that this whole movement actually grew out of internet society. The, we used to attend network technology workshops, and at some point, we realized that a regional activity will bring better focus. So I take this opportunity to thank Internet Society for giving us a soul, for encouraging us, and for supporting us. So I am very privileged to introduce Ms. Cathy Brown, CEO of Internet Society, to share a keynote speech with us. Please, let's welcome Cathy. Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a lovely, lovely time last night at that gorgeous dinner, which we thought was going to be a, um, a cocktail and turned into a lovely gala. So thank you to the sponsors, and thank you to AFNOG and AFNIC and everyone who uh, put that together. Uh, I am very honored to be here today and very, very um, pleased that um, that APNOG has invited us back to speak again this year. We receive a warm, wonderful welcome, and thank you again, Ni, for that wonderful introduction and welcome. Um, as you heard uh, Raul say last night, uh, we are um, so proud and so uh, honored to be here with the community who, for the last 20 years, have really built the foundations of the internet that is maturing across the continent today. We know that over 20 years you have been doing the training and the prodding and the pushing and the, and the, and the uh, um, talking about the benefits of the internet uh, to everyone who will listen. And we are proud at ISOC to be partners with that. We are proud that we together came up uh, through the beginnings of this internet and we're very proud that we're now reaching another whole point in the internet in Africa. We can, in a way, stop talking about the beginnings, although we always will, and now we can keep our eyes square on the future. Um, we especially want to thank Dr. Nee, who um, has been steadfast in his commitment uh, to the internet, and, and to all of us, and particularly to the next generation, as you heard today. The next generation of leaders, the next generation who are now, who are here, who are actually internet natives, who have grown up with the internet now, and are starting to think very deeply and very creatively about what to do with it. Um, as the father here, as he's so called, but perhaps I'll think of him as an elder brother, I don't know. Um, he has, um, he's nurtured and guided us across time and across all kinds of change. And sometimes, like a good father, he gives us a dose of tough love, reminding us that we're here for a, a larger purpose. We are here to spread this amazing tool that we have all developed together to everyone, everywhere. And to do that, we have to remain focused on that goal. Um, his wisdom, his focus on the future is deeply, deeply appreciated. Thank you, Nee. <clears throat> so last year, uh, I was here, we could go to the next slide, uh, talking about the need to build the internet everywhere for everyone. Uh, we talked about the need to um, make our network stronger, make it everywhere. We talked about transcontinental long haul. We talked about the need for underlying broadband connectivity everywhere. We talked about the promise of the new wireless uh, technologies. Uh, we talked about um, routing anomalies that cause the internet to be uh, more expensive here than it really needs to be. We talked about the need to have exchange points, as many as were efficient for the continent. And we talked about the need to host 
content locally and to be able to create content here. We talked about making the internet better. And there we talked about the notion that this, this security issue that you see being talked about worldwide is one that Africa can get ahead of. Uh, there is no need to rebuild the same problems in the new networks we are building. Uh, and there is no need to be afraid of taking on that challenge. Uh, we worry sometimes that the governments worry in a way that would actually stop our progress if we don't address the cyber security issues that have been raised. And we said last year that we needed to have a collaborative approach with regard to this. And then we spoke very importantly about making the internet stronger. And by that, we meant building community making it stronger amongst and between us, across countries, across borders, uh, so that we could progress. Well, there's some good news. In the last year, in the last years, we have made progress in all of these uh, things. We heard this morning, and I was very warmed by this, that the building of community is happening. I love that country by country we are seeing those those mailing lists come up and those communities of people who understand that together they have to solve problems and that is the best way to do it. We know that we have IXPs now in many more places, actually 27, Kevin tells me, uh, 33 IXPs now uh, in Africa, uh, 50 percent uh, of the African uh, countries. Our peering partners are up. By the way, those routing anomalies have to do with the fact that we're sending traffic to Europe. We're not exchanging traffic here. And when you look at those traffic patterns, you just shake your head and say, why are we doing this? It's like taking, as Dawit says so well, taking the airplane to London to get from Johannesburg to uh, uh, Gaborone. It's crazy. We were doing that with our traffic. We're starting to understand what that looks like. And AFPIF, which all of you, many of you are involved in, is really showing how we can bring people together to have them solve problems. And by the way, this is not the government doing it. It's people together figuring out on a network basis what makes sense. I am told that this year's uh, AFPIF is already filling up, that we have more people coming. Uh, that will be the end of August, the beginning of September in Tanzania. I think this is a, is a very promising development. We know that capacity growth rates on the continent are highest in the world. So yes, when you're you know, starting from a low number and you start to get to a better number, your rate is much higher. We want those rates to be high because every year if those rates stay that way, we will go up the curve I described to you last year that we've seen all around the world where we see a full 70, 80 percent of people who are connected to the internet. And we are seeing entrepreneurs now developing, really developing, uh, and using the internet and the uh, and the uh, infrastructure that is available to create other things that are not networks but are businesses, that are solutions to problems that are real, that can only be addressed here in the region. All of this, in my view, uh, accounts for the sunshine coming out. So where are we? I think we are at now ensuring that we stay focused on the opportunities uh, that are provided by the internet we have in place and the internet that is coming. We know that there's some, there's some hesitation on the part of some as to whether this thing is beneficial. What can it do? And we need to demonstrate that and allow that demonstration to happen on the network we have so folks see the benefits. We know that the UN has said we are going to look at sustainability through different eyes now. And by the way, congratulations to all of us to open the eyes of the global policymakers that the internet is the enabling tool for health care, for education, for poverty alleviation, uh, uh, for government services. We know that public health, for instance, is a information science. It has to do with understanding where the problem is, 
how it is proliferating, where the help is, how we do it. This is done on connected networks through data that we all share. It is the core of how we combat some of the worst uh, sicknesses and illnesses on earth. We have to shine the light on these benefits. And we know that the internet and what it brings can allow business, entrepreneurs, innovators to leapfrog problems, to go to new solutions, uh, to the way we actually run our businesses, uh, the way we serve consumers, the way we serve our citizens. Please, please remember these young people who tell me they're not really so young. By this time, they're 27, 28, 30, 35. But these are the people who now are highly educated, understand this technology, and are ready to do things with it, to build businesses, to solve problems, to create new opportunities for other people to have a job. Government policy we keep talking about has got to do with the networks. But honestly, we got that one. What we need is government policy that allows new online businesses to grow. Too many people tell me they don't know what the rules are. Where do I get taxed? Can I actually deliver this product in this place? Can I have employees across the border? All of these issues have to have to settle somehow uh, so that people feel confident that they can move forward with a whole new kind of business. Now what we don't want is the opposite to happen, and I've seen it. You cannot do that because it disrupts something that's sitting there. You cannot have that business because after all, you're going to deliver that product elsewhere and I don't know how to charge you for it. This is the kind of collaborative policy making we are now about to enter. Things are changing, therefore policy frameworks need to change along with them. So I'm suggesting you listen to these young entrepreneurs. And by the way, women are young entrepreneurs. They're not a separate species. They're all together. They're amazingly talking to each other. They're already set to go, so let's let them go. So, next slide. I think the, 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 the key to all of this is our tradition of bottom-up, collaborative, multi-stakeholder decision-making. I get worried that this multi-stakeholder word uh, sounds like it's some kind of religion. It is not. It's a process. It's an approach. It says that instead of a top-down, do it this way, here's the rule, do not go outside the lines, do not color over here, we're saying that doesn't work in a distributed, globally dispersed, equally available network where anyone can talk to anyone else. The way to make policy decisions, therefore, is the same way the internet itself runs. We need to bring the stakeholders who have legitimate interests in things into the conversation. We can do that, and we do do that in the technical community quite well. It's part of the tradition. We do that and are starting to do that much better in the policy space, but not really so much. Even those governments that say they're for it are still using the same old processes they've used since I've been around in government, and that's a good 30 years. That has to change, and we need to see that change now. Now, we are on the cusp, I believe, of an amazing um, uh, success on the uh, uh, in the multi-stakeholder community. We have all together uh, been involved in ensuring that the IANA transition goes forward as the community wants it to go forward. All signs are pointing to our success. And by the way, outsiders looked at that process and said, that's sort of messy. You know, that took two years. 
Uh, what's that about? Well, first of all, let's think about anything that takes less than two years in a legislative process. Let's think about anything that takes less than two years in any kind of law I've ever seen debated. Imagine in two years that we have been able, as a community, to come to rest on how to ensure that the core technical uh, uh, functions of the internet are well protected, run by the community, and not interfered with by any government in the world. I believe we are on at the moment where this is going to happen. This took discipline, by the way, and it took us to commit to a messy but necessary multi-stakeholder kind of back and forth where we reach a consensus. This needs to be a model for us going forward. We don't get to take this one as a one-off. We have said to the world that this is the way to make good decision making, and now we have to stick to our guns on this. We have to use this process, we have to make it be successful, and we have to remember Dr. Nee over there telling us that our end goal is to ensure that the internet is for everyone everywhere. The end goal is that all of us have access to this amazing internet. Next slide. So I think as we now move forward uh, at this tipping point, which I talked about last year, uh, that we need to, sort of like we did 10 years ago, where everybody adopted a broadband plan. Remember, the broadband is the underlying transit. It's not the internet, as I keep trying to remind my friends in regulatory commissions. We need now to have a framework for an enabling environment for the internet. And by the way, we need to keep reminding our friends in, in the regulatory land that they don't, that's not their jurisdictional place. Their jurisdictional place is making sure we have transcontinental long haul, by the way, but that on the next layer where we're talking about the core functions of the internet, as we do with IANA, uh, where we're talking about how we are going to get uh, uh, security, for instance, uh, in the way we uh, um, assure that there's not bugs in our security, sits with us. We need to then make sure they understand. So on this, the infrastructure side, we need the underlying infrastructure. We need to ensure that we ourselves have a governance um, uh, approach, and we do, to how we develop, innovate, and deploy the internet. We have to make sure that government policies enable the use of that internet so that we build the internet economy. And we have to ensure that everyone has access. So it seems to us at ISOC that it's time that we develop that kind of framework that each of us could take back, by the way, to our own representative governments, to our own people, and say, let's do it this way. Let's start to agree on, a, on an approach forward. Let's move to the next, the next place where we're worrying about the internet economy and how on top of this network we are going to see people innovate and in using it uh, for the next generation uh, of wealth, of benefits, and of community um, coherence. Again, I think that as we just move to, to the next slide, that this internet is for all. It is for all of us, it is for Africa, it is for the world, and we are all connected. Africa is open for business. Mobile is helping the way, but so too have the undersea cables that we've seen finally invested in, so too the networks that need to carry that traffic from those mobile towers. So all of this is improving. We also, together with that, need changes in business models and understanding what the economic benefit is in those changing business models. And we need a trusted environment where the internet itself is trusted by those who use it. That is going to bring business to the region. Africa is open for infrastructure investment. You can see it, you can feel it, 
I would still urge you to ensure that that investment stays in the hands of Africans. <laughs> I know that foreign investment is good. We should, we should enjoy and we should welcome that others would want to invest with us, but keep hold of your own destinies. And Africa is certainly open for innovation. Just talk to those 30-year-olds. They're ready to go. They just want to be let loose, and they want to be able to create, and they want to see the benefits of that creation go to their families and their communities and to their future. So let me say this. Next slide. The global internet needs Africa almost more than Africa needs it. And let me say why. As I say to folks at the Internet Society, what we always want is the cutting edge of innovation. And the cutting edge of innovation happens everywhere where there's an edge. And in places where we're leapfrogging like here, sometimes I believe the edge is way further than some mature places where incumbency has already set in. In other words, they've already figured out how to do it. They do it their way. It has good things, bad things. Here, it's wide open. It's new. It's wide open. With the right skills, with the right infrastructure, anything is possible. And any, the next big company is sitting in this room. The next big breakthrough in medicine is right here. The next big understanding of what to do about the environment that is so much more pristine here than in most other places is right here. The world needs Africa. We need the ingenuity and the innovation that's going to happen here and is happening here. I would say to you that the, one of the remarks made earlier is something I'd like you to really consider. The IETF, you all know, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which sits inside of ISOC, Africa is not there. Africans are not there for reasons that may be highly legitimate but that we really have to fix. If I'm right, and if innovation lies here, we need to be writing the code. Those standards need to be part of a whole world view about how the internet is going to evolve. And that means we, you, us, we need to be at the table. I know that uh, I think uh, we're going to have a workshop, I think, tonight. Is that right? At 5.30? Uh, when Matuki and everyone will tell you where, Kevin will tell you where, one of these rooms. I hope you all come because we are working on this hard. We just had our first IETF meeting in Latin America. That took us five years to pull off. To be able, we, I have to be careful, uh, to, with ISOCs, let's go. Uh, there was a meeting, a highly successful meeting with way more folks there who would ever have been there had it been somewhere else. But in order to do that, people had to start participating earlier and show that they were interested. So I think there's a strategy here to bring in those universities. I love that caucus idea, to bring in those students who can then go ahead and, and participate. We provide fellowships uh, to go to IETF. We have fellows all the time. There's no reason why we can't really join hands on this and see if we can't, we in Africa, you in Africa, can't join that very important um, undertaking. So, here's your team, here's our team, our Africa team, and I just wanted to make sure I, you saw them. Who's not up there? It's Victor, because Victor is here helping us from the, uh, the Cameroon chapter uh, while um, uh, we are short one person, and we're happy to have you on board, Victor. You said smiling face is something we adore. Um, our team uh, is here for you, with you. Uh, you know them every day. Uh, I have the highest regard, admiration, and frankly, a lot of affection for this team. So um, 
I hope that uh, you are enjoying them and, and uh, seeing them as productive as I do. And then finally, a big thank you, a really big thank you for having me here. I want you to know that I took this picture in the Akulago uh, Delta. I did what the minister asked. I spent six days uh, in this beautiful country. Uh, it teaches you so much about being in Africa to be on the land and to be with the people. And it was an, 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 a wonderful, wonderful experience and privilege to do that. And it's a greater privilege to be able to talk to you. Thank you again for the warm welcome and let's go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I can only say, my people are ready. Let my people go. Thank you very much. <laughs>